All right, so go and take your Bibles and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. We begin a series today. And, uh, and so this series is going to be one I think is just real practical. For three weeks, we're going to talk about waiting on God and how that looks. I mean, it's something all of us obviously have experience with, but probably most of us, if not all of us, would admit that we've messed up at some point in our life at waiting because we are bad waiters. We could say it like this. I hate to wait. Are you with me? I mean, we hate to wait. We're not, we're not good waiters. We, we really uh, would rather have something immediately. And some of that's because of our culture, the, uh, the culture we've grown up in, North America. Um, we, we really just uh, desire it immediately, everything we do. Let me just ask you, just to show you how bad of a waiter you are, if you think, well, I'm a pretty patient guy or girl. What about, uh, do you like drive through lines? Those things drive you crazy. You ever gotten a drive through line? And the person in front of you is ordering for like a football team or something. And it's just like, you know, you wait like five minutes. And, you're like, and, and usually, I'm not even going to say which restaurants. There's a couple that come to mind that are slower than others. And drive through they just drive you nuts, man. You don't want to sit and wait very long on drive through What about phone uh, conversations? Have you ever called like AT&T or to check out your bill or to argue about something or called your credit card company, whatever, and they're like, uh, an automated operator says your anticipated wait time is four hours and 13 minutes, right? I mean, are you serious? I've got to wait. I'm, honestly, it's sometimes 15 minutes. Who wants to wait 15 minutes on the phone? If you're bad like me, even text messaging. I'm, I'm a text message fool. I, that's how I would much rather communicate uh, in, in our day. For some reason, it's just quicker, easier. Even if you're in a meeting, you can uh, shoot a text message and communicate immediately. But have, are you like me that when you send a text message... If someone doesn't respond in like 30 seconds, you're like, I'm afraid they've had a, a car accident, right? I, well, why aren't they responding to the text message? I mean, if it's like a minute and a half, I call, I call 911. I'm like, dude, something's wrong with my children. Or, I don't know what's wrong. I, I, can't, I can't get in touch with them. We now have gotten accustomed to immediate access. We've grown accustomed to immediate response in our culture. And I'm afraid if we're not careful, that spills over in our Christian faith, our Christian walk. And, and, and we start treating God like we treat each other. And we start saying, hey, God, you know, I, I want to ask your opinion <laughs> about something. You know, I want your direction in my life. And so I'm going to ask you a question, but I, I've really got a time limit. I've got to make a decision in five minutes. Or I've got to make a decision tomorrow. And so we, we, you know, we back God in a corner, and we basically position him to where he's on our timetable and again, this is totally backwards. Everything we're going to say today is really to encourage us to move back to a biblical perspective of Christian living, and that is this. You're not in charge. I'm not in charge of my life. You're not in charge of your life. God is. He's the one who has the, the authority over what happens in your life and the timing. Next week, we're going to talk about timing, waiting on God and the timing of God. Then the third week, we're going to talk about waiting on God relating to his his return, and so being ready at any moment to meet him face to face. And so, man, it's going to be a great three weeks. But, but this whole idea of waiting, it's so challenging. And, and I'm going to read to you Psalm 27, verse 14. Psalm 27, 14 is just a real clear verse that helps us define the three weeks. Here it is. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. You see that? That seems a little out of place, right? Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Now, Usually when you think of waiting, you don't really think of bravery or, or courage. That, that kind of, why in the world did the psalmist put that? And I think the psalmist understood we might think that. And that's why I think he said at the end there, yes, wait patiently for the Lord. It's almost like, yeah, that's what I said, right? Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. And so here's what we know. If you've ever waited on the Lord successfully, you know that it took a lot of courage to wait. It took bravery to wait because it's the easy thing just to do your deal. You know, it's easy just to make your decision. It's easy to go with the flow. It's easy to, to do in, in past weeks what we've talked about is taking that conventional wisdom path, that path that's, you know, the path of least resistance. It's just the, the way that everybody else is going. And so it seems like that makes best sense. So let me do that. Uh, you see, that is what's, that's, that lacks courage. That's not very bold when we do that. But it takes courage. It, we have to be courageous and bold in order for us to really wait on God and be patient for Him to work in our lives. Um, so we live in this world of instant gratification, this, this world of instant availability. 
so that even if something as insignificant as our Wi-Fi goes out, man, you know, it's like the, the, the world has ended, right? Does your Wi-Fi ever go out in your house? I mean, do your kids not just absolutely lose it and think, I'm afraid everything runs on Wi-Fi now. I, 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 do our toilets flush on Wi-Fi now? I, I, I'm serious. It seems like everything's different. When the Wi-Fi goes out, you can't watch TV, you can't do this, you can't do that. Uh, if the cell phone tower goes out, it's like, it's like we're, we're totally conditioned to just immediate availability with all the information. And even if you think about news, used to you had to wait and get the Sunday edition, open an actual paper with, with like in your hands, paper, right? And, and turn pages. And, and now it's, you go to a, a website, get a headline. I mean, it, immediate, instant headlines um, on, on a regular basis. And so this is, this is important for us to, to sit back and hear from God and say, God, I know that I've conditioned myself to this immediate culture, this, this, um, this culture that tells me that, I, I mean, I'm owed the right to know everything now. I want to I be still. I want to be quiet. And I want to listen to you. And I, if you don't speak to the question I'm asking, I'm going to wait right here. I'm going to wait on you. See, that, that's where we've got to be in relationship to, to God's call on our life. This morning, we're just going to look real quickly at three common mistakes that we make. I mean, it's a mistake that, honestly, we've all made at particular times. Hopefully not the overarching idea of our life. But if so, man, today, this is great. It's a clean slate day. It's a day for you to really reboot and, and take a, a new step, a spiritual renewal, a moment where you can lay it down uh, at the altar for God and just say, God, here's my old life, and I really do want to give it to you. I want my life to bring glory to you. I want to, I want to live a life of purpose and significance. I don't want to waste it on myself. And so with all that in mind, what, what are some mistakes that we can make while we're waiting on God? In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, this is a passage that, man, I learned as a child, and, and you've probably heard it many times, but Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 just speaks so clearly to this idea of waiting on God. It says in verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not depend on your own understanding. Man, that last part is, is the part I have to remind myself of continually, because I always try to figure it out. I always wanna, I'm a fixer by nature, and so I, I, I try to understand things, and I try to reason it out. And let me just say, in our day, there are some things that are unreasonable. There, there are experiences we're going to have. There are going to be circumstances in our lives that are just unreasonable, and things aren't going to always make sense. Our culture is so crazy, guys, that on any given day you can turn the news on, and, and any event or any issue that comes up, our nation is literally divided in half most of the time. And, and here's what we've got to rest in. We've got to rest in not some political party or political position. We've got to stop trying to rest in the opinions of a news anchor or someone in Hollywood We've got to rest in the God of the universe, man. See, yeah, he's the one ultimately that's going to, to give us, to teach us, to give us the wisdom that we need to live in this crazy, crazy world. And so, man, if we don't get this, then what we're going to do is we're just going to be jumping from thing to thing, from event uh, to event, from experience and circumstance to event and circumstance. And, and we're going to never just rest and wait and listen to hear from God. And so what are these mistakes? First thing we need to see right clearly from verse 5 in Proverbs 3, 5. Here's what we, we see. A mistake that we try to be the architect of our own lives. We, we, try to, we try to build our own lives. But even when we were talking about this song a moment ago, I will build my life upon your love. That whole song talks about, you know, the fact that the foundation of our life that we'll get to in a minute is so critical. And, and where we build and where God really builds our lives is, is essential, that, that we've got to find the rock. But, but right here we're talking about the architect, the, the one who builds the plan, the one who draws up the plans for our lives. See, we want to be the architect. We desire to draw up our own plans. We desire to map out our own destiny. We really want to be the ones who are sitting at the drafting table, you know, and kind of figuring out, here's where I'd like this. I mean, here's the way it goes in our lives. You know, by this age, I want to do this. By this age, I want to do this. I want to have this many kids. I want to have this kind of house. I prefer it this color in this neighborhood. You know what I'd really like? Two and a half children with a white picket fence. You know I mean? Whatever, you know? 
I, I, it's like we just, we're so weird. I mean, we've, we've, we've so been consumed by this American dream that we, we just lose sight of the fact that we do not belong to ourselves. You know, from a biblical perspective, now we're talking to Christians right this second, right? If you're a Christian, then biblically you died when you met Jesus. You died to yourself. See, that's really what, what being saved is. And if you're, if you're here and you're kind of seeking and you're trying to figure out God and you don't know, all, this is, it may not sound like a very attractive explanation, but it is truth. This is truth theologically. When you come to Jesus, what you're doing is you're saying, I give up. And I surrender me and, and I, I accept Jesus. I, I, I'm dying to my sin and myself and I want to live for Jesus Christ. And so what happens is, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, a literal death, I mean, Jesus really died. It's a historical fact. When Jesus died on the cross, when he was nailed, here's what happened. My sins were nailed to the cross with Jesus. And so my old life, my old man, it died with Jesus on the cross. And here's the beautiful thing. Baptism represents this. When we're, when we, when we're baptized, it represents that resurrection. See, Jesus didn't just die. He also rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, we rose to new life to walk with him forever. So we live not our old life, but our new life. And see, again, that is so simple, but we don't live like we get it. I mean, as Christians, we just live like we're living our life. We're doing our deal. We're going through the, the motions of everything, but this is my life. This is what I'm going to do. I'm drawing up the plans. But see, Scripture tells us, Paul told us, that we've been bought with a price. He purchased us when Jesus died on the cross. And so we're, we're no longer our own, man. We belong to Jesus. And so all of that, here's what it means. It means I'm not my boss. I'm not the architect of my life. I mean, I'm not the general contractor. I'm not the builder, really. Ultimately, I'm the project. I am, I am clay in the hands of a master potter. And he is shaping me continually for his perfect plan and his perfect will. And here's the deal. Maybe nobody's ever told you this before. And this is total truth regardless who you are, man, woman, boy, or girl. God has a plan for you. Man, God has a plan for you. He's got a beautiful plan for you. It's a whole lot better than your plan. Man, he's got a plan for me. It's a whole lot better than my plan. And if I try to take the authority back, and if I try to take the pen out of his hand, and if I try to start drawing my own plans and, and kind of working it out my own way, then here's the deal. I'm messing up because I'm, I'm not good enough to be the architect of my life. I will totally fail. And so we've got to understand that's a huge mistake when we come to this point of trying to make a decision of, of, you know, how can I make sure I'm waiting on God? Well, don't get the pen in your hand. Uh, that's step one. Stop trying to be the architect. If you want to really wait on God, how can you be successful? Stop it. Get out of the chair in front of the desk. Allow him to be the one who makes the plans for your life. Wait on him. You say, I'm tired of waiting. Well, I mean, I get that. Because, again, we all get tired of waiting. But we've got to wait patiently on God. Because he will ultimately show us the way we're to go. Now, we're called, obviously, to discover God's plan, but we're not called to develop our plan or our purpose. That is God's desire. That's God's uh, responsibility. He is the, the developer of our life plan. But we do develop the gifts that he gives us. We, we develop the, the, the talents and, and even the resources that he gives to us. We, we have to be responsible, obviously, but it's all under his authority. Uh, but it's not easy to wait on God. Just like we've said a moment ago, God's plan, man, as it's developing, it just takes a lot of time, takes a lot of patience. Uh, and we're so conditioned to have instant awareness of all information, like we said earlier. The world has gotten so much smaller, and we live in a day of instant notification. We're, we're probably, we all have apps that whenever something significant happens in the world, you know, we immediately have a notification that it comes up on our phone and we see, oh, wow, okay, that's happening. But think about it for just a minute. The, the vast majority of even communication is electronic in our day. You know, the times of snail mail are, are virtually gone. I mean, it's, it's rare that you get like a card, a handwritten card from someone in the mail. It really should mean something now. When you get a prayer gram from the prayer ministry when you've been sick 
or you had surgery or something like that. Why? Because people just don't do that anymore. Man, people just don't take a pen and, and a piece of paper and actually write a note to people. Most of the time, it's, it's an electronic, you know, communication. It's a text message. It's an email. And, and, and so we're, we're so conditioned as instant gratification, instant information. And if we're not careful, we miss so much because of our desire to have it immediately. In fact, we're conditioned to have the answer, I mean, right when we ask it. And this spills over into our Christian walk. We tell God, I'm gonna, I definitely want to hear from you. God, I want your opinion about my plan. That's usually our approach. But here's the deal. God's plans are not subject to our demands. And like we said uh, a moment ago, we come at it and we say, Hey, God, I really want your input, but I want it in five minutes. Look, God is not on our timetable. We're on his. And so here's the thing we have to do. We have to back up and we have to remember to rest. We have to remember to, to wait. We have to remember that even in our weakness, our weaknesses are not subject uh, I'm sorry, his, his, his answer or his plan is not subject to our weaknesses. We may say, well, hey, God, I know you got a plan for me to go there or do that, but I don't really want to do that. Or maybe even I'm not gifted to do that. Maybe, maybe I, I, I'm embarrassed to do that. I'd be very uncomfortable to do that. But see, at the end of the day, his plans are not subject to my weaknesses. They're not subject to my approval. I'm just, I'm just called to say yes to what he's leading us to do. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Listen to what it says in the ESV translation. It says, Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and grow weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What a wonderful promise from God that even in our weaknesses, man, that's when God brings strength. And so if we'll rest in him, if we'll wait on him, then what happens is we, we find out that his plan is so much more beautiful. His plan is perfect. Man, there's, there's examples. And man, if I started mentioning one, listing one, I'd have to list several but there's so many examples that came to my mind this, this week as we were getting prepared for the message. And just people in this service, in this congregation, that, that God has just blessed in a remarkable way through waiting. Through waiting. And, and, and testimony after testimony, people would say it like this. Man, you know, this, this thing that, that honestly is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. This event that, that a lot of people would see was just destructive and terrible. And, and, and discouraging. And God somehow has brought me through that. And now I see the plan. And I get it. And, and I, I, li I like it. I'm so happy that he brought me through the valley. Because now looking back, his plan was a whole lot better than mine. You know, I mean, that's it's hard to understand. Hard to imagine when you're going through it. But God shows us on the other side that he blesses us even through and amidst. Uh, the difficulty. But not only do we try to be the architect of our own life, but secondly, I want you to see, uh, we sometimes attempt to build our lives on the wrong foundation. Now, Matthew chapter 7, we remember immediately the parable of the builders. Did you, you ever sing that song? Uh, the wise man built his house on the rock. We're not going to sing it right now, all right? But wise man built his house on the rock. Rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down, floods came up. Uh, but the house on the rock stood firm, something like that. All right, y'all knew it. Uh, so that, that song, even as a kid, we get that, right? We understand that when you build a house, the foundation matters. Well, this parable, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus teaches us that there was a wise man who built his house on a rock, and when the rain fell, the, the floods rose and the wind blew, but that house stood firm because its foundation was firm. But then there was a man who built his house on the sand. The man who built his house on the sand, when the rain fell and the floods rose and the wind blew, his house fell, and great was its fall, Jesus said. Now, why would he go, you know, to emphasize, the, the, I guess, the severity of the fall or the event? Man, it's because we get that. We understand that sometimes, even in our lives, we have had a moment where our foundation was firm. 
But maybe certain events and circumstances, maybe even today, you've gone through a recent circumstance or event that has really led you to a point where you would have to admit, right now, brother, my, my house is on some shifty sand. I mean, it's not, I'm not on the foundation that I've been on before. I've kind of left the rock. Now, I've kind of got some beachfront property, right? And I'm kind of I'm building it, not, not just like with beach view. I'm actually like really close to the water. I've gotten far away from the rock. I'm far away from the stability and the security of the foundation that I know God would have me to build on. And see, this is what we need to hear today. Here's the, the truth. Most people take, o, uh, take over the control. In fact, I shouldn't even say most people. We all do it sometimes. But, but we take over the control of our lives, and then we complain about the outcome. I mean, it's like we, we know God's leading us to do this, but we do that, and then we're, we're upset with God because stuff didn't work out the way we thought it should. But the truth is we didn't follow him. We didn't do what he told us to do. And, and somehow we, our foundation changed. And, and, and so we have to remember to, to go back continually and make sure that our life is being built. Every decision is being built on the rock of Jesus Christ. Because you can be a follower of Jesus and get this wrong tomorrow. You can, you can kind of start uh, constructing your own uh, guest house, right? Somewhere else and, and do it completely different and God not be over that. But here's the deal. You can't build your house on the beach and then complain when it gets flooded. That's what we do. I mean, we position our lives in a vulnerable position and then we get upset with God when things don't work out the way that we think, they should. 1 Corinthians 3.11 reminds us of this truth. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, there will be people who will come at us, especially in this day of great confusion. They will attempt to take us and distract us with this direction or that direction, this, this issue or that issue, this peripheral thing. We're in a day of uh, animated peripherals, man. I mean, it, it's so crazy because everything is being amplified and things that, that shouldn't be the main thing are becoming the main thing. Listen, there is no foundation. There is no agenda. There's no political party. There's, there's no club you can join that will suffice. Look, the only foundation for your life is Jesus Christ. That's it. You, you want your family to grow up, your kids to grow up, to be solid and godly children? Man, you better build your house on the rock. You better build your house on Jesus Christ and, and stop being distracted by the things of the world and the craziness going on and, and all these things that, that beg for our attention and our investment. The truth of the matter is, man, Jesus is what it's all about. No matter who we are, no matter what we think we're about, man, we've got to get pulled back and driven back to this rock that is Jesus Christ. So we, we oftentimes attempt to build our lives on the wrong foundation. But then finally, I want you to see... A third mistake is that we want his direction without following his directions. And this is probably the most confrontational because, honestly, we just don't want to hear the word obedience at all. I mean, even in our culture, in our day, children just, just on, I, I don't know why something's happened in our, in our day and it's, just, it's really weird and confusion. There's no, there's no excuse for this. But somehow you almost have to, in a kid's mind, the kid wants you to explain to them the why all the time if you're the parent. And here's, I was raised in a day, honestly, where if my mom and dad said to do something, that I didn't really have to ask why. Because you know what I would have said if I would have said why? Because I said so. Were your parents like that? I'm the only one. <laughs> right? No. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. When you, when you are told something by God, you should obey it. I mean, it's not like a debate. It's not like a negotiation with God. He's God. And, and ultimately in our lives, we could definitely narrow that down and, and, and get into the family and understand the reason why we obey mom and dad and the reason why we shouldn't debate them and we should just honor them and respect them is because, man, in their home, man, God has put them in authority over you. They're responsible for you. And so really the, there's some biblical principle, obviously, for, to support. I mean, you've got to honor and obey mom and dad. But even more importantly than that, we, we obey God. 
When he has a plan for us, we yield to that plan. We shouldn't negotiate or try to convince him to come our way. We don't plan our plan and then say, hey, God, would you come affirm my plan? I've got a really good plan. Let me show you what I've been doing with the place, you know? No, we, we say, God, you're responsible. We want you to be the one who's mapping this out. I'm not going to seek your direction in my life without honoring and yielding to your directions. I, I know that I mean, God has to just look down at us sometimes when we're like, oh God, I'm at the crossroad and, and I really need your direction. I need some advice on which way to turn. And, and I'm sure he's just thinking, man, I have told you so much. I've given you direction after direction after direction. And you are not listening to me. Wayne, you aren't doing what I've already told you to do. So start doing what I've already told you to do, and then I'll give you further direction. You see, we want God's direction inside our plan, but that's not the way God works. God is going to give us direction as we yield to the directions he's already given to us. And then we find ourselves at these crossroads, and we don't know what to do. We don't know which way to go. And a lot of times people come and ask that kind of question, Preacher, what, what do I do if I, if I don't know what to do next? You know, I, I feel like this could be a good way or this could be a good way. Or maybe you're at a crossroads and you say, man, there's no good way to turn. I mean, every way I go is bad. So I just really don't know what to do. I'm confused. We've all been there. No need to raise our hands. Look, the truth of the matter is, in those moments, we can run back to this simple piece of advice. And that is that when we don't know what to do next, we do what God told us to do last. When we don't know what to do next, that's a whole lot of times, man. In my life, there's a lot of times where I, I just don't know what to do next. I don't know what the next step is, you know? It's like you're crossing a river and you get to the last rock, man. You're only halfway there and you're like, whoo, where am I going? The other day, Amy and I went up to Gatlinburg by ourselves, and we stopped in the uh, Cades Cove Park and I got out in, in the river and I was kind of like just walking on the rocks. I could tell my wife was extremely worried, you know? And sure enough, when I turned around and was walking back, I slipped off the rock and got my foot stuck down in that. Uh, but I'm not injured. Hallelujah. Amen, you know? But, uh, but that, you know, I, I was just thinking, you know, crossing that river. Have you ever got to cross a river if you're doing that kind of stuff, playing in a river, and, and, and you couldn't, couldn't go any further? Now, our lives are like that sometimes. We just don't know what to do. We don't see another step. We know we got to go, but we don't know what to do. Here's what we got to do in our lives. We wait. If we don't know what to do next, if we don't know what next step to take, we wait and we continue to do what he told us to do last. And, and see, in some of our lives, we're, we're just like, we're puzzled because we, maybe we even served in this area or we served in that area, and, but we think we're done. You know, we think we're retired or we think, we, hey, we, we put in our time there or done that, but, but we don't know what to do next. So I'd say continue to do what God told you to do last until he tells you to do something different. Because God will speak to you. And if you wait on the Lord, God will speak to you. And if he's not speaking right now, he, he wants you to do what he told you to do. <laughs> Go back. Listen. Remember. What did he say last time he spoke to me? We have to remember to wait on the Lord. We want accessibility without accountability. The truth of the matter is we want, we want the direction from God within our plan. We want to, we want to have access to God, but, but we don't want to be held accountable for what he's already told us to do. And at the end of the day, we've got to remember that when we seek his will, that's when we're going to find our way. When we seek his will in our lives, that's when we're going to find our way. That's what the passage says. Look there, verse 6 again, Proverbs 3, 6. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you. He will show you. Will you say that with me? He will show you which path to take. It's not a question of if he's going to show you. Man, if you seek his will in all you do, God will show you which path to take. You may be here from out of town. You may be a guest. Maybe you just moved into the upstate. There are tons of people moving into our area. And, and here's what I want to ask you. If you never come back to our church, maybe this is a one-time deal. I think God, God is speaking to people today. Here's the question. Who's drawing your floor plans? I mean, who's really, who's the architect? Who's in charge of the plan? Are you the builder? Are you the contractor? Are you the project? Are you the clay in the hands of the potter? Tillman's going to come, and he's uh, going to lead us in a song in just a moment. 
Um, and as they come, I just want to challenge you. Maybe you're here today and you've never made a decision for Jesus. Maybe you've never made a commitment to follow him. And you'd just say, you know what, Wayne? I, man, I don't even know right now. If I died today, I do not know if I would go to heaven or hell. I just don't, I don't have an assurance in my salvation. And I want to challenge you to come down. Find a minister. Ministers will be all over the front here. Um, we'd love to talk with you about your salvation decision this morning. Maybe you just want to come to the altar and say, God, I, I want to lay my, my life on the altar. I want to just give you my plans. I'm surrendering my plans. I want your plan in my life. I want to follow your plan. I'm going to wait on you. If that's your commitment today, then I want to invite you to come and make that decision. Let's, let's pray together. Lord, we love you. I thank you for your people, God, here at First Baptist and those who have joined us today. Lord, I pray you to speak to us. Allow us to really yield to you. That's what, God, that's what we want to do. We, we don't want to be in charge. We mess it up. So, Lord, help us, teach us to build our lives really truly on you, your love, your gospel. Speak to us today. Help us make the decisions we need to in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?